So our first speaker today is Dr. Kieran O'Connor, senior lecturer in the School of Geography, Archaeology and Irish Studies in, in University College Galway. Uh, he, he's worked during much of the 1990s for the Archaeological Survey branch of the National Monument Service, and he was appointed a research fellow at the Discovery Programme in 1997, made director of the Medieval Rural Settlement Project there in 1999. His research interests include castles, medieval rural settlements, high me medieval Gaelic Ireland and medieval landscapes. He's a council member of the Heritage Council, fellow of the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland and a fellow of the Royal Society of Antiquaries of London. Um, he's carried out fundamentally important work on medieval settlement, on medieval castles and the experiences of both native and newcomers in medieval Ireland. Um, so we welcome our, our first speaker then, Dr. Kieran O'Connor. Have you got the paper there? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks Colleen. I'm, a, I'm afraid I'm a little cowardly. I actually wrote, wrote out the paper, so Colleen was about to run off with it there, which wouldn't have been good at all. Okay, but anyway, um, so the title of the lecture is English Peasant Settlement in Anglo-Norman Ireland. And anyway, just starting off, the arrival of the Anglo-Normans to Ireland in 1169 is often viewed, for good or for bad, depending on your point of view, as the opening act of 800 years of domination by England. But we must remember, too, that the Norman French speaking, or at least we would think Norman speak French speaking Anglo-Norman knights, in the decades after 1169, even up to the mid-13th century, encouraged mainly English-speaking, Middle English, I would think, speaking peasants, but also some Flemings and Welsh to settle on their newly acquired manors in Ireland. And there you can see some of, some of that there. Uh, we often see the Anglo-Normans as being one group of invaders, but clearly the people who came to Ireland in the wake of this partial conquest, again in my opinion, were from, to say the least, different ethnic and social backgrounds. They were not a homogenous group of people, and this is sometimes forgotten with the newcomers termed under the one heading of Anglo-Norman. But putting it all in its context, uh, the period from circa 1000 AD to circa 1300 AD, which coincided or coincides with the medieval warm period uh, in climatic terms when average yearly temperatures were a little higher uh, than later centuries, this period was a time of major economic and population um, growth across Europe. Overpopulation in core areas of Western Europe led firstly to peasants and lords asserting and settling on peripheral parts of the lands they lived on, land that had either been forested or unsuitable for agriculture hitherto. In the present context, due to this overpopulation, men and women of all social ranks began to migrate to and colonize quite distant lands. For example, just putting it in its context, for example, between the late, uh, sorry, between the 10th and late 14th centuries, but particularly during the 12th and 13th century, hundreds of thousands of German peasants, um, German peasants encouraged by their lords, moved eastwards and colonized large parts of what is now East Germany, Poland, the Baltic states, and the edges of Czechia, with some getting as far as present day um, uh, Estonia. So there, you know, in a way, you can read that there. P pink areas, 12th century, orange areas, 13th century. That move eastwards by German peasants. German scholars believe that anything up to one million to one and a half million Germans moved eastwards during this whole period but largely between 1100 and 1300. Massive number. For example, here are some images of a site. Sorry, now, next. Yeah, here are some images of a site uh, known as Altfortenberg. Uh, it was founded by a German lord in the early 14th century. It was completely destroyed by the Lithuanians at some stage over the winter of 1353-54 and then permanently abandoned. Good for archeology, span bad for them, okay? This is cu currently being excavated by a joint German, I've got another one there, a joint German-Polish uh, team who have strong links to the Chateau Geyer and Ruralia research groups. 
different movements of not only members of the lordly class, but also peasants took place, also took place in other parts of Europe and further afield at this time. For example, Christian Spain was expanding southwards at this time, and again, thousands of peasants, and particularly younger sons of the lordly class, migrated to uh, the Holy Land during the Crusades of the 12th century in search of a better life. Closer to home, it's clear that there were also considerable movements of peasants, uh, English and Flemish peasants, into coastal South Wales, particularly South Pembrokeshire, and the very southwestern, uh, southwest of Carmarthenshire, and even Scotland, both before and after 1169. Remember, Pembrokeshire, South Pembrokeshire to this day is called Little England beyond Wales, um, and that kind of says it all. In summary, therefore, Ireland's experience of widespread English peasant colonization um, in the decades after 1169, encouraged by Anglo-Norman lords, um, in the decades after 1169 and into the 13th century was not unique. Population increase in particular meant that peasants of various ethnicities were on the move right across Europe during this uh, whole period, but particularly during the 12th and 13th century. What do, we, what do we know about the amount of English peasant immigration into Ireland during the Anglo-Norman period? Detailed socio-economic documentation relating to Anglo-Norman society and economy uh, date mainly from the late uh, 13th century. Far less detailed historical evidence survives for the early period of Anglo-Norman settlement in Ireland during the late 12th and very early 13th century. Historians like Otway Riven have long noticed this, but I think many have failed to realize the potential of archaeology, particularly archaeological excavation, to contribute to our understanding of this early period of Anglo-Norman settlement. Sometimes I feel that archaeologists, historians, historical geographers, and scholars who study medieval literature in, ver in its various forms work in different silos um, and separate silos and do not truly appreciate what other disciplines can bring to the study of the medieval period. Moving on quickly, uh, these detailed uh, socio-economic documents indicate by the late 13th century, many of the manors in areas conquered and settled by the Normans uh, since 1169 contained large numbers of peasants of mainly English origin, um, living in close proximity to ordinary Irish tenants. Now, for example, here, in, uh, I was going to say figure six, but you don't know that. For, there's a manorial extent of the manor of Cluncurry in 1304 suggests that over 50% of the tenants on that manor uh, appear to have been of English descent at that time. Overall, it seems that a wide range of manors throughout eastern and southeastern Ireland had large numbers of peasants of English ethnicity living on them by the late 13th century. In fact, historians like Otway Riven have argued that by 1300 or so, anything up to 50% of the manorial population in some agriculturally fertile lowland areas of eastern and southeastern Ireland were the descendants of mostly English peasant colonists uh, who had arrived to Ireland in the late 12th and early 13th century. Equally, other areas of conquered by the Anglo-Normans saw little English peasant settlement. Tom McNeill, for example, in his 1980 book, uh, Anglo-Norman Ulster, indicated that the great majority of manorial tenants in the Anglo-Norman earldom of Ireland were native Irishmen with little in the way of English immigration. Uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a way, uh, this shows that the geographical extent, if you like, of English peasant settlement and Anglo-Norman conquest were not one and the same uh, things. Now, again, if, if we look again, if you look at things like, um, in some areas, the conquest only saw the removal of the Gaelic elite and their replacement by Anglo-Norman lords. Uh, tenantry and labor on the manors created in such areas remained mostly Irish. Indeed, in many areas, but particularly more Western ones, uh, such as in the De Burr Lordship of Connacht, even the Gaelic elite remained in place and continued to live on some of their old lands. 
uh, now paying rent and military service to their Anglo-Norman overlords. So if areas of Anglo-Norman uh, military and political control and English peasant settlement do not always correlate, where then did the latter settle in numbers, i.e. English peasants? Historians looking at the evidence from surviving manorial extents and inquisitions post-mortem would say in a very general way that these peasant colonists settled in numbers across eastern and southeastern Ireland in a swathe of the country from East Cork up to what is now the Ulster border with Leinster. Can we be more specific than this? I would think yes if we use place name evidence and combine it with the surviving historical evidence as recommended as long ago as 1970 by the historical geographer Jones Hughes and the historian Watt at a slightly later date. So here is a distribution map of place names, almost all townlands, ending with the English word town, such as Luttrellstown or so. Some of these place names are clearly associated with the plantations of the late 16th and 17th century, but it would seem that most of these place names seem to date to earlier periods, and where they cluster, they have been seen as indicating areas of heavy English peasant settlement during the Anglo-Norman period. You know, again, these areas include South Wexford, uh, Dublin, Meath, eastern half of West Meath, the southern two-thirds of Louth, a lot of East Kildare, the area around Carlow Town and East Wartford. And again, you know, there's a scatter, there seems to be a good scatter of English settlement across Kilkenny, South Tip, East Limerick, and around Cork City and the area between it and Yall. Again, note the difference between areas of Anglo-Norman political and military control and actual English peasant settlement. The map on the right being, um, you know, areas of Anglo-Norman political control. I could even um, increase the, the area of Anglo-Norman political and military control, um, but compare it to the place name evidence on the left. So there's a difference between Anglo-Norman military control, political control, settlement, and actual English pe peasant settlement in the ground. In fact, English settlement was so strong and dense in places like southeast Wexford, uh, in, particularly in the Baronies of Forth and Bargy, that a, a, a language derived from Middle English survived as a spoken language there into the 19th century Yola. And a very similar language called Fingolian, also derived from Middle English, also survived in rural North County Dublin, and probably in Meath too, until the 19th century as well. Fingolian and Yola, I suppose, are the later echoes of the language spoken by English peasant settlers in 13th century Ireland. So I would posit then, therefore, that these above-mentioned areas were the rural regions where English peasant settlement was quite dense. Anglo-Norman lords needed labor to work their new lands, particularly men with the knowledge to work the great open fields that produced grain in great quantities during this period, as there seems not to have been enough native Irish labor available to do this. Evidence suggests that many of these peasants came from England's West Country and the Anglo-Norman settlements in South Wales. The availability of land and the potential for employment in Ireland must have been major enticements for these English peasants to move to Ireland. However, at times, more might have been needed to encourage these people to move to what was often a troubled uh, and turbulent frontier, at least in the early years of the colony. The experiences of Alan of Bildwas, Bild, Bildwas, a Cistercian lay brother and so a probable peasant stock in the late 1170s suggests that early colonists of all social ranks and ethnicities faced dangers, even in places like South Wexford, from the ferocity of the inhabitants. An anthropologist will tell you from what I know is that it's rare, rare is the cultural or ethnic group who will calmly let their lands be taken without some form of resistance. Presumably, even in settled areas, heavily settled areas, there must have been danger from small bands of dispossessed members of the local Irish elite, particularly in the earlier part of the colonization process during the 12th and 13th century. The periods for which we have little surviving detailed socioeconomic documentation Certainly other enticements were used to woo peasants over to populate the manors of 
uh, large parts of Eastern Ireland. Anglo-Norman lords offered these peasants a chance to raise their social status to that of free tenants or burgesses, even in rural settings. Another major enticement for peasants uh, to migrate to Ireland from our neighbouring Ireland was that labour services were far lighter on Anglo-Norman manors in Ireland than on manors in England or in South Wales. You know, things like this help explain why peasants would come to Ireland, despite the real or perceived dangers. But in comparison uh, to the colonisation of large parts of Eastern Europe, we know little about... Sorry, why I go forward... Uh, we know little about how these peasants were recruited, chosen, and the organization behind how they came to settle uh, in, on particular manners. We know far more about these processes from German, uh, in German lands. Most German peasants, from what we hear, going eastwards, uh, willingly went east in search of a better life. But there are quite a few references surviving to peasants being offered a Hobson's choice criminals being effectively asked to choose between moving east or being imprisoned or even executed. Uh, it's some choice. Uh, examples exist of German lords pardoning criminals and sending them east to settle on the new lands. Perhaps some English peasants came to Ireland under such circumstances. Whether it was Eastern Europe or the new colonies in Ireland, such men were tough and even ruthless, qualities that may have been useful uh, in the colonization process in both territories. And there, I suppose you've been reading that, but there you can see, you know, sending a robber eastward because he was a brave man and ready for war. Uh, the locator, you know, it, it, this, this is from the um, uh, Heidelberger Saxon Spiegel, but it gives a depiction. The, the uh, locator, who's probably from a minor lordly background, has been granted the right uh, to clear forest for farmland and to build a village. He's recruiting, he's recruiting peasants. They're building houses and taking down forest. And then he's giving judgment in front of the church of the new uh, settlement. You know, you know, so things like that are, are useful for Ireland, I think. Um, English, the movement of English peasants uh, to Ireland. Okay, while the historical place names and even uh, much later linguistic evidence suggests there was considerable English peasant immigration and colonization ac across quite large parts of eastern and southeastern Ireland, a number of scholars have noticed that it is difficult to distinguish in these areas between English peasant settlement and low status Irish or Beater settlement by excavation and field work alone. In a general sense, the evidence from the documentary sources, such as it is, suggests that Irish tenants and Anglo-Norman manors, mostly beaters, lived in kin-based house clusters some distance away from the capital or centres of these manors. The problem here is that certainly from the mid-13th century, if not before, there is evidence for individual peasants of English origin living out in the townlands that made up manors, also at a distance from the manorial center, centers. Furthermore, there's also some evidence to suggest Irish tenants on these manors were living in isolated farmsteads or in clusters of two or three farmsteads well away from manorial centers. The difficulty lies in deciding what is the archeological signature for farmsteads and small settlements inhabited by English speaking peasants from ones occupied by Irishmen of the same status. It can be difficult in many cases to draw definite conclusions about the ethnicity of a site's occupants based on settlement morphology and material culture alone. You know, just as an aside, this is partly because many medieval peasant farming sites across Ireland, Britain and Europe that were occupied for even long periods of time, regardless of ethnicity, do not produce much in the way of fines when excavated. This lack of, this is not always the case, but, but, but it has happened. This lack of fines seems to be explained because house, household rubbish was often collected, dumped into manure heaps, and then spread out as fertilizer on surrounding fields. It may also be an indication that many of the everyday objects used on medieval farms were made of organic materials and do not survive to be uncovered by excavation. I'm, I'm reminded of the description of Ackle in 1900. The people of Ackle rarely use metal tools. 
you know, so it's something uh, rather like that. Irish and English tenants lived in relatively close proximity on many manners in Eastern Ireland. Processes like acculturation, even intermarriage, similar responses to local physical conditions may also have lef lessened the differences in material culture between the two ethnic groups. Despite these problems and general observations, scholars have, have at times um, attempted um, to identify the ethnicity of the occupants of a lower status rural settlement by material culture. For example, the excavator of Addy Flynn, County Limerick, James Ogan, noted that this settlement of 13th and 14th century date was located in the peripheral part of a manorial estate, away from its caput, and the fact also that finds of shards of cooking ware were rare from the site, as there's some evidence to suggest that the native Irish did not tend to use pottery for the preparation of food, something confirmed actually by Michelle Comer's excavation in Carraconnell. Anyway, he argued that this site may be a settlement inhabited by Irish tenants, possibly beaters, but who were perhaps of a higher status than this based on the evidence of some of the finds. Beaters, I might add, can be quite wealthy. For example, some manorial extents of around 1300 suggests that the Irish beaters on these manors appear to be wealthier or had the potential to be wealthier than the lower grades of English tenants on them. The 13th century was a very prosperous period and it would, um, in, it would be, uh, in my opinion anyway, that all levels of society, regardless of status or ethnicity, benefited from this prosperity. On the subject of further differences in material culture between the Irish, English, and for that matter, Anglo-Normans, it has been suggested, again based on a mix of historical, later pictorial, and a little excavated evidence, that the continued use of post and wattle buildings uh, as residences was a Gaelic Irish cultural trait, regardless of status, and that timber frame buildings were to be seen in Anglo-Norman and English uh, peasant rural contexts. So there's been some attempt to try this and solve this problem of identifying low status Irish sites from English peasant ones by recognizing differences, even slight ones in material culture and house types. But arguably much more could be done to answer this question. How can this relatively small amount of work be built upon? The historical background and sighting of low status settlements are important in this regard to help understand the lifeways of English peasant settlers and their immediate descendants in 13th century Ireland. And if possible, to build up some roadmap as to how archeologists carrying out future excavations can distinguish between the settlement sites of the different ethnicities. In this regard, the historical evidence does suggest that the inhabitants of the rural boroughs um, effectively agricultural villages with market functions and the nucleated villages at manorial centres were invariably of English rather than Irish origin. This seems to have been particularly true of those large parts of eastern and southeastern Ireland mentioned above, where historical and place name evidence suggests heavy English immigration uh, took place during the late 12th and 13th century. At the very least, the excavated evidence from such sites, such as Dunmanogue here, um, will pro provides, or in the case of somewhere like Newtown Gerpoint, will provide, particularly from their earlier layers, um, much needed information on the lifeways of ordinary English immigrants and their immediate descendants. And also, you know, evidence from Teresa Bulger's excavation at Mullock Mast, or, um, future excavation at sites like Castle Moor. We can see the geophysical evidence is suggesting uh, quite a large, in this case, rural borough nucleated settlement beside uh, the Mott here. I just see, I think we've got a, yeah, we have a, a reconstruction there of the village rural borough at Castle Moor uh, in County Carlow. So basically the excavations that have taken place or, the, or in more particularly the excavations that will take place in the future 
uh, we may be able to build up a profile, if you like, of the material culture uh, during this early period, uh, early period of English peasant immigration uh, and migration into Ireland. Uh, so, if you like, then, the historical context of a site is important to identify settlement sites occupied by English peasants. In this regard, I argued back in 1998 that the evidence from such nucleated settlements that had been excavated indicated that two-roomed houses divided into living and sleeping quarters with a central hearth in the former area, regardless of whether they were built of cobstone or were timber framed, were popular in such nucleated settlements, which the historical documents would suggest were basically inhabited by English peasants. Such uh, house plans are known from peasant contexts in villages in England of the same day. So I think we argued, you know, here, um, you know, this was a two-room house and that this was a barn, okay? So living area and then some sort of perhaps sleeping quarters here. And they're quite similar to plans from English uh, village uh, excavations, both the farm and the, the peasant cot. You know, things like that. Uh, the only problem is 200 years later, we find something similar uh, in a Gaelic context, but at a much later date. Okay, building up a profile of how to identify English settlement sites from ones inhabited by the Irish out beyond the manorial centres across the landscapes of the manors is a more difficult task for all the reasons mentioned earlier in the paper, but I think it has to be attempted. One way to achieve this is to use, I've kind of said this, is to use the excavated evidence from places like Dunmanogue or Mullochmast or the evidence from future excavation at sites like Castlemore or Newtown Jerpoint, and we really need more excavation of these sites, combining it with evidence from the towns and cities which we know from the historical records were mostly inhabited uh, by Englishmen by the early 13th century to build up a picture of the typical material culture and house types found on English settlement sites of the Anglo-Norman period. Using this profile, which would be combined with the available historical and place name evidence, a way to identify a dispersed English peasant settlement on the periphery of manors away from manorial centres may be found despite the difficulties involved. Coming towards the end, on analogy with elsewhere, in particular England, it is also highly likely that many of the moated sites built across eastern, but particularly southeastern Ireland, were built by prosperous peasants of English origin in the period from the mid 13th century into the early 14th century, maybe a bit later. And there we can see, you know, there's just uh, some aerial photographs of moated sites with the distribution map of moated sites in Ireland, which needs to be a little bit updated, but it's still uh, pretty good. And there's a reconstruction of a moated site excavated by Grace Fegan in, in uh, South Wexford. Okay, so invariably moated sites are located away from manorial centers in more peripheral parts of the manor. Certainly the finds from many of these sites are linked to farming and while suggesting prosperity are not particularly high status in character. I've argued elsewhere that the distribution of moated sites in eastern and southeastern Ireland is best interpreted as representing the furthest extent or high tide, if you like, of English peasant settlement at this time, rather than reflecting the farthest spread of Anglo-Norman elite settlement per se, which was far wider as already stated. The results of the excavations, the results of the excavations carried out on NRA, Transport Infrastructure Ireland, road schemes, and other developments over the last 20 or 30 years or so has dramatically increased our knowledge of rural settlement during the Anglo-Norman period, particularly in lowland parts of Eastern and Southeastern Ireland, where English peasant settlement was dense. One surprise to me was the amount of undefended, isolated farmsteads of 13th, 14th century date, along with a number of hitherto unidentified moated sites that were identified and excavated during the course of these infrastructural developments. 
for example, here at Boyerstown, and there's a plan of Boyerstown there as well. I'll go back to that. The picture that emerges from these excavations, if it is combined with evidence from the surviving historical sources, is that the rural landscape of 13th and earlier 14th century Eastern and Southeastern Ireland was a more managed, populated, and wealthier place than was believed back in 1998 when the Discovery Programme published the archaeology of medieval rural settlement in Ireland. Tenants, whether English or Irish, on Anglo-Norman manors in Eastern and Southeastern Ireland seem to have achieved prosperity during this economic boom of the 13th century. With the combined evidence, I would feel, suggesting in certain areas of Eastern Ireland that this prosperity continued in core areas into late medieval times and beyond, despite the speed bumps of various famines, the Bruce Wars, the Gaelic resurgence, and the Black Death along the way. A peasant, uh, living, living, a peasant living on a manor uh, in, in um, places like Meath, North Dublin, East Kildare, South Wexford, and in the environs of Cork, living, we'll say, at Castle Moor, you know, the village or borough, but, you know, the nucleated uh, settlement beside Castle Moor in County Carlo near Tullo, or living in a moated site like Ballyvinny here nor, near Cork City, uh, a peasant living in, in, in such a place, speaking by now uh, an Irish dialect of Middle English, speaking, thinking, being there around uh, 1300, must have believed that the decision of either his great-grandfather or grandfather from England or the English colonies in South Wales to migrate across the Irish Sea and St. George's Channel across to Ireland had been the right choice. He or she must have felt that their immediate antecedents had created or at least colonized parts of the land not un unlike cocaine. Now that is not a reference to seizures off the southeast coast of Ireland, but to the mythological land of plenty in the medieval mind. So, thank you. Yeah, that's it. I'm a bit, er a bit early, am I? Yeah, there. There.